Thank you, Kay Digo, for having me uh, here. I think the topic is really appropriate for a controversies conference because it is a controversial topic, and hopefully we'll have a good discussion uh, on the potential utility of genetic risk scores in uh, disease screening. I do have some disclosures. None of them are really relevant to the uh, topic um, that I'm going to cover today. So I'd like to start by um, taking kind of a geneticist's view of complex traits. And of course, from the genetic perspective, we always think about common diseases uh, or diseases in general, human diseases in two categories, monogenic diseases uh, or Mendelian traits that are caused by rare alleles with really large effect, typically observed in families. Uh, these are penetrant disorders. Um, uh, and of course, they have a large effect on the uh, disease risk. Uh, but they're relatively rare in the general population. On the other end of the spectrum, there are complex traits that are determined by a combination of multiple risk alleles, and the cumulative effect of these risk alleles uh, expresses itself as a disease. And of course, that is um, the model that is being used to develop polygenic risk scores. However, um, with a recent generation of kind of large data sets that uh, contain both uh, sequence data for example, exome or genome sequencing, as well as array data, there's also um, an opportunity now to unify these models and look at the effects of polygenic background on the, um, uh, on the penetrance of monogenic disease, as well as variable expressivity of monogenic disease. Of course, um, comp the genetics of complex traits has been revolutionized by the genome-wide association studies approach and thousands of uh, different risk alleles, different risk loci have been associated with um, many different human diseases and traits, uh, as illustrated by this graphic taken from the NHGRI uh, catalog. Um, and, uh, you know, frankly, the clinical translation of these findings has been lagging behind, and I think from my perspective, there are two major opportunities for translating uh, GWAS findings into clinical applications. One is drug target discovery, which I'm not going to discuss here today, but the second opportunity is actually polygenic modeling. And so um, when we think about these complex traits, each of these loci discovered for, um, uh, you know, uh, in association with susceptibility to a certain trait has typically relatively small effect size. So individually, these loci are not really helpful for risk stratification. So polygenic, so the concept of polygenic risk uh, pertains to um, kind of capturing, uh, building a model, a predictive model that captures cumulative effects of these uh, common risk alleles. And so in its simplest formulation, genetic risk score um, has been devised early on in the GWAS studies and the general concept is as follows. So you have your genome-wide association study for a trait of interest. This is a Manhattan plot with each dot representing a common variance across the genome. Um, and on the y-axis, you have level of statistical significance. Typically, we use very stringent thresholds for statistical significance to define genome-wide significant loci. And the simplest way that you could quantify risk uh, when you have uh, GWAS for a given trait is to just sum up the um, uh, independent uh, risk alleles across um, the significant loci um, and weight the sum by the effect size from the discovered GWAS. So this is what I will refer to as genetic risk score. You can then do this um, for different populations. You can derive mean and standard deviation across the population. You can standardize this metric um, uh, so that you could um, compare these, um, um, uh, the risk score across populations. And if your risk score is performing well, of course, the cases will have a rightward shift of the distribution. And you could think about selecting a, an actionable threshold for risk prediction. Uh, in this case, you know, it's uh, odds ratio of two, um, but it is very uh, phenotype specific. Uh, and beyond that threshold, you can define individuals at high risk of the disease that might be um, uh, clinically meaningful or amenable for an intervention. Of course, this is a very simple um, formulation of genetic risk score. This concept has been extended genome-wide um, to capture the effects that might not necessarily be genome-wide significant but still contribute to the disease risk. So genome-wide polygenic risk score, um, I'll refer to it as GPS, extends this GRS idea by taking all of the uh, common polymorphisms across the genome. There are uh, uh, approximately 10 million of these. 
again, uh, it uses the um, weights that are defined by the effect size estimates from the discovery of GWAS. And one important aspect of this methodology is that you need to account for linkage disequilibrium or non-independence of variance across the genome. So there are several different methods that have been developed to do this. Uh, these are the two most commonly used methods. P plus T is basically you, you threshold uh, your SNPs selected for prediction based on their significance level and the level of um, uh, linkage disequilibrium or, uh, or non-independence. Typically, you know, it's a complicated uh, 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 concept and um, uh, there are two parameters that go into estimation of the risk for using this method, the, the significance and the linkage disequilibrium parameter. So you typically need an optimization cohort to really optimize the score to fit the phenotype. And then, of course, you need to validate it independently. Another method um, was developed to um, uh, um, kind of also uh, takes a slightly different approach, takes advantage of uh, uh, linkage disequilibrium score regression, uh, where basically it adjusts the individual SNP weights based on linkage disequilibrium. Um, and there are many other methods that are kind of uh, evolving rapidly in this space uh, to better capture the risk alleles in a uh, polygenic risk score formulation. So when I think about modeling the polygenic risk for kidney disease, um, uh, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, you know, phenotype, uh, kind of fitting the model to a specific phenotype. I'm showing two kind of extreme uh, phenotypes uh, within the kidney space studied by GWAS. One is the GWAS for um, estimated GFR uh, performed by the CKD Gen Consortium in over a million of individuals using eGFR as a quantitative trait. Um, that study, uh, there are bigger studies uh, that, that follow this study. This study was published in 2019. They've um, discovered 300, over 300 genome-wide significant loci. However, when you actually sum up the effects of these loci and ask a question, how much of the uh, variance in the phenotype in EGFR is explained by these loci, it's only roughly 7% of the variance in, in EGFR that is accounted for by these genome-wide significant loci. So this is one example where actually using some of these genome-wide polygenic risk score models um, might be helpful because just including genome-wide significant loci might not be enough to capture enough risk. On the other extreme is uh, GWAS for membrane nephropathy, which was actually performed by my group. Um, and here we have four genome-wide significant loci. But these four genome-wide significant loci explain 30% of risk, uh, so much larger effect size. Moreover, there's a significant interaction between phospholipase A2 receptor locus and HLA. So clearly, if you want to model polygenic risk for membranous nephropathy, you'll take a different approach than genome-wide um, uh, polygenic risk. And probably uh, the GRS approach or the simpler approach is uh, more, su you know, better suited for this type of uh, modeling. What are the major um, limitations of polygenic modeling and, and um, why this is becoming a controversial topic? The major limitation is ancestry bias. Um, so it is, uh, uh, this, this paper actually uh, from uh, Mark Daly's group in 2019 uh, makes a very strong point by, by demonstrating this graphic. Um, basically, it um, uh, illustrates that roughly 80% of GWAS participants um, up to 2019 are of European ancestry. So th this is really not reflective of the global uh, ancestry. And so there's a strong ancestry bias in the discovery of GWAS. Uh, only roughly 16% of global populations is of European ancestry. So clearly, building these polygenic risk scores based on GWAS um, uh, of European ancestry uh, will create uh, biased uh, risk estimates. And in fact, um, this can be systematically tested, and it was tested in this paper in a, uh, using a UK biobank resource. Uh, you know, 17 quantitative traits were studied by polygenic risk scores. The accuracy was compared uh, for polygenic risk scores when they were developed in Europeans and then applied to other populations. And you see dramatic decrease in accuracy as you move um, away from uh, European ancestry. And, and in fact, the greater the um, ancestral distance of, uh, of a given population from Europeans, the greater the decline in performance. 
So why, um, what are the factors that drive this uh, uh, decreased or poor cross ancestry, we call it transferability or portability of the risk scores. So I already mentioned European overrepresentation in GWAS, but the problem is actually even deeper than that. Um, early microarray designs were really based on data, genomic data from Europeans. So the arrays themselves are biased towards Europeans. Our imputation panels early on were also biased uh, towards European populations. In addition to this, when we think about applying a polygenic risk score developed and optimized in European populations to other populations, there are clearly differences in linkage disequilibrium or the haplotype block structure uh, across the genome between populations. And if we rely on tag SNPs um, to predict risk in these non-European populations, um, we, our weight adjustments um, in the polygenic risk scores will be misspecified. Um, and that is another important factor why uh, the performance declines. There's obvious, there are obviously also differences in the environment between different ancestral groups, um, and the environmental factors are really not well measured or captured uh, in polygenic risk scores, but these will affect the weights as well as you move uh, uh, a risk score developed in Europeans to non-European populations. And um, lastly, there are actually true differences in the genetic architecture between populations. So, for example, the GWAS for EGFR, even though it was uh, developed, you know, it was um, uh, run on uh, uh, nearly a million individuals, it does not pick up APOL1 effects, right? So, we know that APOL1 effects are, uh, APOL1 is um, uh, present exclusively in individuals of African ancestry. The effect is recessive. GWAS is run under additive model, predominantly European, the effect is completely missed. Of course, APOL1 has large effect on the risk of uh, kidney disease in African um, ancestry individuals, and applying this European risk score to African populations misses that opportunity. So, uh, you know, we feel that APOL, that th this is an additional uh, problem, and there might be other risk loss I like this that are not included in present risk scores. So um, I'm part of the uh, bigger consortium called Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Consortium that um, is actually tasked at tackling this issue of clinical translation and, and application of polygenic uh, risk scores and implementation of polygenic risk score, uh, risk score methods. Um, our task was very ambitious. We are in a fourth year of the consortium, but um, the consortium uh, basically aimed to pick up 10 most promising polygenic risk scores, validate them across different ancestry groups, optimize the risk scores that might not work well to improve their trans-ancestry or cross-ancestry portability, and then prospectively recruit 25,000 individuals across 10 different sites, uh, predominantly in the U.S., uh, enriched in people of an various ancestral backgrounds and perform PRS testing in a CLIA lab, return the PRS results, recommend interventions, and uh, capture outcomes. Um, and I'm happy to say that chronic kidney disease made it to the list of 10 conditions. Uh, this was partly because we actually had to do a lot of work um, to demonstrate that um, PRS for uh, chronic kidney disease has a potential. This is how um, one of the major issues with implementation of polygenic risk scores is how do you actually um, formulate the test and implement in a CLIA lab. Um, as part of eMERGE, we work with the Broad Institute um, sequencing lab that has implemented a CLIA pipeline for this. Um, basically, the way it works is we obtain DNA sample from patients. Um, we then uh, um, genotype the sample with a um, uh, genome-wide uh, SNP array, uh, we use uh, GDA array, which is the same array that is being used to genotype all of us participants. We then do CLIA-based imputation across the genome, and um, we uh, then generate risk score distributions, and we had to devise methods to actually standardize the risk scores across different ancestries, so you could use a single cutoff for um, uh, that would be equivalent in terms of uh, 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 risk effects. Um, that could be applied across diverse ancestries. And we use a number of tricks to do this, but we basically regress the um, uh, risk score value 
against the principal components of ancestry uh, to standardize the mean as well as the variance of the risk score. Uh, ultimately, we have uh, an adjusted risk score for which we select a threshold, which is kind of uh, ancestry uh, uh, phenotype specific, um, and uh, we generate a high risk report, which is being returned to the patient. Complicated process, but we don't stop there. Actually, it's, um, it was decided by the consortium that just pure polygenic risk information is insufficient. Polygenic risk score uh, information should be delivered in the context of uh, broader uh, health status and additional uh, risk factors. So we actually do monogenic testing uh, in, um, uh, as part of the eMERGE protocol. Uh, we collect family history through an online uh, tool called Mitri. Uh, and we also uh, collect all of the relevant clinical risk factors through automatic extraction from electronic health records across all sites. We then integrate all of this into one single report for 10 conditions, which is being returned to the patients with lifestyle um, and interventional uh, recommendations. So very complicated process, um, but this is already in the works. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about our work on CKD risk as part of this consortium. So as I mentioned, um, we're in a fourth year of funding. The first year was really designed to prioritize the polygenic risk scores for implementation. And being a nephrologist, um, I felt an obligation to tackle the um, uh, polygenic risk for CKD. I have to say that I was very skeptical at the beginning that this is going to work just because the SNP-based heritability of EGFR is relatively low. Uh, we are all aware of all of the uh, limitations of EGFR as a phenotype in genetic studies. Uh, and frankly, if you look at the SNP-based heritability of CKD, it's even lower. So I, didn't, I wasn't sure if this, is, if this was going to work. Nevertheless, as part of uh, our eMERGE activities, uh, we decided to tackle this and uh, we at the time, the uh, Wutke study from the CKD Gen Consortium on EGFR was the largest GWAS for renal function. Uh, we utilized uh, 1,000 genomes reference panels to construct the score. We used UK Biobank, a portion of the UK Biobank, to optimize the score, uh, to optimize the weights. We then decided to model APOL1 effects, which was critical because APOL1 effects, as I mentioned, were not captured by the Wutke study. Um, we did this on a subgroup of African, of genetic uh, ancestry defined African participants of the UK Biobank. And it turned out that after standardization, the risk eff uh, effect of APOL1 alleles, of APOL1 risk genotype, is roughly equivalent to one standard deviation of polygenic risk. So then we um, came up with this equation, which basically adds one to the standard, standardized polygenic risk when APOL1 risk genotype is present. Um, otherwise, uh, the, the, the APOL1 component is ignored. Then we validate this in a completely independent cohorts of various ancestries to see how well we're doing with this approach. Uh, and this is just an illustration um, of how, of the additive effects that, uh, of APOL1 and polygenic risk, which I think is important um, uh, and, and kind of new piece that emerged from this study. Uh, this is based on six validation cohorts of African ancestry, uh, roughly 14,000 individuals in total, and we're looking at the risk of CKD stage three or greater as a function of the quantile of GPS on the uh, x-axis, and on the y-axis we have odds ratio of CKD stage three or above. And so you, what you can see, appreciate is that uh, there is clearly, um, let's see if I can make the pointer work. There's clearly an effect of GPS um, on the risk of disease in non apol one um, uh, uh, individuals, but there is also a clear gradient in individuals who do have apol one high-risk genotype. And these lines are pretty much uh, parallel, so the, there was no uh, significant interaction between these two risks. Uh, we concluded that the risk is roughly additive uh, between the, the, uh, uh, the two risk factors. And then um, how well are we doing with um, the overall risk or performance? We tested this by ancestry as well, by individual ancestry groups. These are just meta-analyses across multiple cohorts that we've done and all cohorts combined. These are odds ratios for the um, uh, effects at the extreme tail cutoff of the risk score. 
Uh, so we're looking at the top 5%, top 2%, and top 1%. Um, and you know, for some ancestral groups, we have really wide confidence intervals because of this uh, tail cutoff and because our sample size, despite multiple cohorts, is not that great. Um, however, you can see that there is this, is, this, uh, this um, vertical line implies no effect, it's a ratio of one. You can see that there is a significant effect of the risk score, polygenic risk score, across all ancestry groups. And just for reference, I include the odds ratio of three, uh, which we used as a reference point in making a decision to select a cutoff for return of results, uh, because odds ratio of three is roughly equivalent to the risk conveyed by positive family history of kidney disease um, based on um, uh, epidemiologic studies. What about monogenic risk? So there's also data emerging from um, our group at Columbia. This is a paper from 2019 uh, that involved uh, exome sequencing of a large group of uh, patients with CKD, an unselected group of patients with CKD um, that were exome sequenced and interpreted for uh, monogenic um, uh, uh, monogenic diseases and roughly 9.3 percent of um, the, this overall um, uh, po population of uh, over 3,000 patients carried uh, monogenic uh, disease risk variants. So it's a si significant portion of patients with CKD that actually have a monogenic contribution to their disease. And if you look at the uh, chart of which diseases are contributing most, uh, PKD and uh, COL4A are by far most common. So we actually uh, next asked the question, how, is there a role of polygenic risk stratification among those with monogenic forms of kidney disease? This is a very difficult question to address because one, you need very large sample size to pick up the uh, rare monogenic causes of kidney disease and two, you need both genome-wide SNP data to derive your polygenic risk predictors, but you also need sequence data to accurately pick up the uh, pathogenic variants in, uh, in your patient population. So we had to pull data across two biobanks in order to do this, UK Biobank as well as all of us. We had to uh, phenotype both um, biobanks using standardized methods, so we developed an uh, electronic phenotyping algorithm for CKD. Uh, we had to harmonize the genotype data, so we actually imputed the entire all of us phase one uh, for this study, and then we had to define, we had to also harmonize the sequencing data to define variants of interest uh, for the analysis of these uh, interactions. And so, um, First, we looked at ADPKD, because ADPKD obviously is one of the most common forms of monogenic uh, kidney disease. And with the pooled um, biobanks, UK Biobank and phase one, all of us, we had 600,000 individuals in this study. We defined, um, we took sequence data, exome sequence for UK Biobank, genome sequence for all of us. We defined um, loss of function variants by using prediction algorithms, and we also uh, filtered all of the variants in PKD1 and PKD2 genes uh, using ClinVar. Uh, using very stringent definitions, we required at least two independent submissions for var uh, with, var with variant determination of being pathogenic. So it's a very stringent definition, and then we applied very stringent math filter, um, um, uh, so minor allele frequency filter of less than 10 to the minus 5. So with these very stringent filters, we ended up identifying uh, 2006 uh, carriers of uh, pathogenic ADPKD uh, mutations, so PKD1 and PKD2 mutations. So we tested then, uh, we can then test how, what kind of phenotypes these individuals have using phenome-wide approach. When we do that, of course, cystic kidney disease comes up to the very top, and of course, all of the related phenotypes um, uh, are showing up as uh, very significant, reassuring us that we're, you know, our variant selection strategy works. But then we look at the effect of polygenic risk on uh, the uh, risk of CKD uh, stage three or greater by carrier status using this very stringent definition. And what you can see here is th these are non-carriers and these are the 200, roughly 200 carriers. They're stratified by the tertile of the genetic risk, uh, genome polygenic risk, 
and we use intermediate um, tertile in non-carriers as a reference point because that is most reflective of kind of general average population risk, and we calculate odds ratios for all of these different subgroups. And so you can see, you know, as expected, there is an effect of GPS uh, on a risk of CKD stage three in non-carrier kind of general population, but there's also a fairly strong effect among those that carry pathogenic ADPKD uh, mutations, suggesting that, you know, the, the polygenic risk score could be really helpful in stratifying PKD patients into those that are more likely to progress to uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, uh, so you, you can see that, uh, you know, especially it's impressive that the odds ratio for, um, for the lower tertile in the carriers um, is three, but for the upper tertile is several magnitudes, uh, 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 several fold higher. We did similar analysis for collagen four um, uh, alpha nephropathies. And we observe very similar pattern with lower odds ratios as expected since this uh, disease, um, you know, leads to um, this under additive model also. So it includes just um, uh, heterozygotes. Um, but you clearly see that there's a similar pattern. Uh, there's a, 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 a positive association of the uh, GPS and it modifies the expression of uh, CKD3 in um, collagen 4AN. So these are really promising results. Um, this, this, this paper is actually going to come out uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, but I, I wanted to summarize some of these uh, findings and tell you where we're going with this. Um, so, you know, I do think that I actually convinced myself that GPS, this, this method, will be useful for risk stratification. But it's still not good enough, I think, for uh, clinical use. Although, you know, I think the prospective um, phase of the eMERGE study will demonstrate some, uh, you know, will provide some hints about clinical utility. But I think if we have to go to the top 2% of the distribution to define high risk, um, that is still problematic. I think we still need to improve the polygenic risk score predictor so that we can capture a greater population uh, at risk. Clearly, um, I think it's very convincing that monogenic risk, APOL1 and polygenic risk, all add, all add up, basically all uh, act as additive risk factors. We still don't know to what degree positive family history for kidney disease contributes to this, but we, uh, for kidney disease. However, from other complex traits, it appears that the risk conveyed by positive family history adds a completely independent aspect of risk information. Uh, so, um, and this has been studied across many different uh, phenotypes right now. We are studying this uh, question in an eMERGE uh, consortium where we have granular family history data. And, you know, I think from my perspective, my lab is really now concentrating on optimizing the predictive performance of polygenic risk score and improving cross ancestry portability. And we're working with the CKD Gen Consortium on their newest uh, GWAS for, uh, uh, for renal function that now involves 2.5 million individuals. It is more enriched in uh, minority populations underrepresented in, in previous studies. Um, and we also have newer releases of all of us data which allow us to actually optimize and validate some of the scores across very diverse ancestry groups. And of course, as part of eMERGE, we'll get some idea about prospective util clinical utility of the risk score approach, of the polygenic risk score approach um, in a prospective fashion. So uh, we are roughly at 20,000 patients recruited at, in eMERGE right now. Um, we are expected to close recruitment in the next couple of months. And then over the next year, we'll analyze the data and the outcomes of return of results. So hopefully we'll get answers uh, on this uh, very question soon. So with this, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, people from my lab that do uh, uh, a lot of the hard work on polygenic uh, modeling, especially Atlas Khan, who's a talented um, computational um, geneticist. Um, uh, who is now K founded by the NIDDK, uh, and my colleagues and collaborators, especially Ali Garavi, uh, as well as uh, colleagues from clinical genetics and bioinformatics, and uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. <laughs>